Thank you for praying. Let's turn to Ephesians today. We're going to revisit the city of Ephesus and see here, just as Jesus prayed for all of us in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, here in Ephesians, chapter 3, Paul is praying for the church in all its generations, including us. So you'll notice on the message notes that as Paul prays, there's a picture of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Now, do we think that the Apostle Paul literally had our church in mind? Well, maybe not. But it is a prayer for all generations of believers. And as we turn to this passage and this subject, I want to suggest to you that if you want a quick education on prayer, Google the words prayer rule. It will take your computer about six tenths of a second to come up with 125 billion uh, sites that you can look up. And this is how I came across a Christian comedian by the name of John B. Crisp. And he has a sub, uh, take on the subject of table grace. His uh, video has over a million views, so I the guy may be on something. Let me give you five highlights as we approach the test. Especially if you're in a restaurant. He asks the question, do you pray if you receive chips and salsa? Or some kind of appetizer? And he says, no, you don't need to pray for the appetizer if you've ordered an entree. And okay, so there's a rule. His rule on salads is this. If it comes with dressing, it doesn't need blessing. <laughs> he has a rule on salads that says, oh no, that's the salads. He has a rule on soup that says if it's served, you pray if it's served in a bowl. If it's served in a cup, you don't need to pray. And here's his quote. If it comes in a cup, no need to lift up. The policy on French fries is that you can have three before praying. <laughs> Before you reach for that fourth cry, you better fold your hands in prayer and say grace. But of course, this is all silly and harmless, but historically, there have been some pretty serious divisions on the subject of prayer. And in fact, if you go to that Google page I mentioned, you'll notice that there are websites listed that represent all of the major religions of the world and their rules on prayer. I want to suggest to you this morning the best rule to follow on the subject of prayer is the rule of Scripture. The second best rule to follow is to model our prayers after those recorded in Scripture. And as we did just a few moments ago, use the Lord's Prayer. I want to invite you to turn with me then to Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14. And here the Apostle reassures them. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how high and excuse me, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeas immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That is a prayer by the Apostle Paul. Now, he, the 
begins the passage with the words, for this reason, which refers back actually to the first verse of chapter 3, where he intended to start the prayer, but got a little sidetracked in explaining himself. The Spirit revealed something new to Paul, and he wanted to make sure to get that down. He comes back to the prayer here based on chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, and the news that there is no longer any distinction between Jew and Gentile. We are all one family in Christ. And that fact alone motivated Paul to pray, to get on his knees and express a prayer for all who would believe. And so what we want to learn this morning is that as Paul prayed for the whole family of God, he prayed for us too. And it will help us to know what he prayed for so that we can join God in bringing an answer to that prayer. So let's note first that Paul prayed for us. When we look at verses 16 to 19, Paul prayed, first of all, for us to be strengthened in verse 16. How would that happen? First of all, strengthened out of God's glorious riches. Now, it's not that the riches are glorious, it's that God is glorious, and he has all the power, all of the authority, all of the material that we need in order to succeed as believers, to grow in our faith. Glory is an earthly manifestation of God's presence, and whether it's described as cloud or light, or it is some kind of miracle or an overwhelming sense of awe in the presence of God. The point is that we know God is present with us. And friends, that makes all the difference. We are strengthened with God's power. The strength that God gives us is most obvious to us in moments of weakness. The strength that God provides through His Spirit is most clear when we are in times of opposition, when the enemy is working against us. Then we know and feel and sense God's empowerment. Where does he send that power? Well, according to verse 16, he sends it to our inner being. According to verse 17, it, he places it in our hearts. And we know that those are really just two ways of saying the same thing. That God empowers our inner person so that we can live emotional, mental, moral, social, spiritual lives in His presence. In fact, in Romans and in 2 Corinthians, Paul said that his inner man was being renewed daily by God. What, what a wonderful testimony. Would that all of us felt that way, that daily renewal in our inner selves. The purpose of this is to receive Christ in our inner being, in our hearts. Look at verse 17. Christ dwells in our hearts. In verse in uh, chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prayed that the eyes of our hearts, which is a curious expression, the eyes of our hearts would see Jesus, that we would know him better. In chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, he wrote about hard-heartedness and how that is the condition that makes people spiritually insensitive and leads to all kinds of sin. This is possible, Paul wrote, only through faith. Only through faith can we have Jesus dwell in our hearts. And faith, folks, is trust. It is trust in God. It is trust that his words are true, his promises will be kept, and that we can rely upon him. This is the trust that allows us to receive Jesus is our Savior, and lean on Him as our Lord. And the effects of the indwelling Christ are threefold. Let's look at them. First, being rooted and established in love. Paul is mixing his metaphors here a little bit. Agriculture tells
tells us that a deep root system allows the plant to draw nutrients and water from the soil and makes for a healthy plant and one that withstands the storms of, of uh, nature. We know from architecture that a good foundation is necessary in order to erect a building that will stand and be safe and secure for a long time. So with both of these metaphors, Paul is essentially saying the same thing. That we are established in love. That it's love that grounds our lives. It's love is the essence, the essential virtue. It, it's where uh, the one from which we all live and direct our days. The second benefit of the indwelling Christ is to have power. But notice what he writes power together with all the saints. Verses 18 and 19. Well, what is this power good for? This power is good to grasp the dimensions of Christ's love. Now, when you grasp something, it requires the use of strength in your hands, the ability to gird your fingers around something. Otherwise, it slips through your fingers. Metaphorically, a weak grasp is something that we don't fully understand or we don't fully appreciate it, so we don't hold it dear. We don't hold on to it. If we have a grasp of this passage and we're paying attention to what Paul wrote, we notice that he gives us four dimensions to the love of Christ. Normally, when we're measuring an object, say this communion table, we would measure it in three dimensions, wouldn't we? But here he adds a fourth, and, and in so doing, I think the Spirit is saying to Paul and to us through him that there's more to Christ than the physical. He is also spiritual. And to paraphrase Paul, he might say something like this. You will never know the full extent of Christ's love, but you are required to spend your lives trying to know it. We'll never really be able to measure the love that God has for us, but we should be spending our time appreciating that and seeking to understand it. We have a limited capability, but that is not an excuse to stop us from trying to know God. The third benefit of the indwelling Christ is to be filled with the fullness of God. Now this also is a paradox, or it sounds a little illogical, because the fullness of God is without limit. We, can't, we are limited. We can't be filled with something unlimited. It simply exceeds the boundaries of who we are and what we can understand, what we can describe. So Paul's prayer for us then is that we would know all we can of God and not be satisfied with that. That we would keep learning, that we would keep growing, and that our knowledge of Him would be increasing as our days go by. His prayer is that more of our conscious thoughts would be on God. So that's Paul's prayer. Let's notice secondly his blessing, the ending of his prayer with what we would call a doxology, similar to the one that we sang just a few moments ago. This is in verses 20 and 21. Paul uh, said that God's ability to bless us defies our definition. God's willingness, His power to bless us, exceeds our ability to understand it or take it in. Paul sets our limits aside, God's unlimited nature, to motivate us to humility. Now we go about in, in our days, and, and certainly in, throughout the history of Christianity, trying to systematize things, trying to uh, promote a particular theology or a point of view, and, 
and God transcends all of that. We need to, in humbleness, recognize that uh, our definitions, because of their humanness, are only partial. That there's much, much more to be revealed and to be known about God. The key, friends, is to do what we can with what we know in the moment and always seek to know and to do better. Paul wrote that he, God, he blesses us by means of his power that is at work within us. Look at verse 20. I would not have to go over that word, work, without noticing it. God does not limit his action to the scope of our prayers. God is at work in the world all the time. He is at work in your life in various ways, and he is not waiting for you or I to give him permission. That's not the purpose of the prayer. The purpose of prayer is to recognize where God is at work and align ourselves with what he's doing. He has offered to work within us, to work with us. And as we sang at the beginning of our service, that we bring Christ to the world. We represent him. And then third, we notice in verse 21 that God is worthy of our worship. The key word here is glory. Glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. You see, friends, we have an opportunity because of the indwelling Christ, because Paul prayed this for us, we have all that we need to put a human face on our spirit, who is God. We have an opportunity to be his voice, his hands, his feet in this world, to impart a genuine and human representation of the divine God in the church and in Christ Jesus. How long? For all time. Paul wrote throughout all the generations. As we sit here this morning, we see a few generations before us. And there are, as uh, Paul wrote in the Hebrews, a great cloud of witnesses that we do not see. Previous generations who have worked and labored, and that line and that heritage stretches all through human history. And that line also stretches on to the future, in generations yet to come, forever and ever. So as Paul prayed for the whole family of God, he prayed for us too, in this moment, here at Emmanuel Baptist, that we would be the presence of Jesus Christ, and being that presence, we would make a difference. Let me distill this down for you as we close. One, uh, real quickly, three prayers. Three very simple prayers that can be part of our daily discipline of prayer, based on what Paul revealed and prayed for us here. The first of those prayers is this, Father, strengthen us with your power. Father, strengthen us with your power. Far beyond the empty promises of the world, far beyond the unheeding false gods people promote, far beyond our understanding or even our imagination, God offers us his unlimited supply of strength, knowledge, life. Christianity is not just another self-help group. It's not another example of group thing. It is a window that God has opened so that we might glimpse heaven. Second prayer. Father, renew us with a vision of your love. Father, renew us with a vision of your love. Suffering tries to convince us that God is either weak or unloving or, or unreal. 
It can be convincing and it can drain the vitality from our spirit. And when that happens, we often retreat into formalism or legalism or traditionalism or any other kind of ism that isn't really God and shows that we don't really care. God has demonstrated in this verse that he really cares and he wants his people to care too. The third prayer, Father, rule over us. Father, rule over us. We show God's love by the sacrifices we make to accommodate one another. We show our love for God by obeying Him. In both cases, selfishness needs to disappear. All of us together, not the building, not the place, not the sign, not anything else. We together are the church, the body of Jesus Christ. And we are to be led by God. People in the world especially need to be inspired. They need to see something in the church that distinguishes the church, the people of God, from everything else the world has to offer. As we do that, individually and together, we will see people drawn to the life Jesus offers. We celebrate that life and we celebrate the salvation that God has given us through Jesus Christ. All the things that Paul prayed for in this prayer come to pass at this table as we celebrate Jesus death and resurrection to eternal life. Would you take your songbook, please? We need to prepare our hearts to worship Jesus in this way. Our call to communion is number 330 in your songbook.